fussing a fault. I can barely see that clock back there. <laughs> but anyway, uh, in all seriousness, it is a blessing to be here. And as I was coming down here with my family yesterday, uh, getting near Montgomery, Alabama, we passed a great big fancy church building on the right. It said, A Church of Christ that cares about its community. Now, I got to thinking about that and uh, in view of Bellevue. Now, these community church kind of congregations, that's their emphasis. All we care about the community, you know, we're really involved in the community and all that. Well, the Bellevue congregation is really the one showing love for Pensacola and the surrounding world by sending out these messages through the internet and other ways and having these lectureships. And all the faithful congregations are represented by these many good and faithful brethren here today. These are the brethren and the congregations that really care about their community. If we don't present the truth and love the truth and defend it, we don't really care about the souls of our community or anywhere else. Amen. If we love people, we will care about their soul. This is what the lectureship is all about. Souls of people, the Lord's church, glorifying God, exalting Christ, and keeping the church in strength. And I do appreciate the faithful congregation here at Bellevue. The elders, the preacher, half of which, uh, Brother Michael, he's half the eldership. But I appreciate him and Brother Brantley so very much. I'm thankful for them. As we consider the topic, confess your faults one to another, friends, we know this is a very important topic. And moreover, it is a very personal one. Because every one of us, whether we be preachers and elders or not, we've had to confess our faults before. We know this is important because God commands us to do it. Number one, James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. <clears throat> Secondly, it is important because Christians do sin. That's a fact. The Apostle John is so emphatic about this that he said, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1 verse 8. That's very plain, isn't it? Verse number 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar, John said. He says that we do not have the truth in us if we deny that we have sinned. 1 John 1, verse 10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. If Christians never sinned or could not sin, then why do we continually need the blood of Christ, which the apostle says that we do need continually? 1 John 1 verse 9 or 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So he's not talking here about members that are not faithful. He's talking about those who walk in the light continually need the blood of Christ. Now that's a powerful message right there. That doesn't mean that we have the license to sin or that we may continue in sin, that grace may abound, God forbid, Romans chapter 6 tells us. But it does mean that we need the blood of Christ not only when initially we come to the Lord, and undergo graciously God's first law of pardon. But also, as Christians, when we sin, we need God's pardon and forgiveness again. And there are times we need to confess our faults one to another. 
We know in Acts chapter 18, verse 8, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. In Acts 2, 38, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 22, 16, Luke records, Ananias words to Saul of Tarsus, And now why tarest thou arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's when the blood of Christ takes over initially when the alien sinner comes to Christ. That's God's first law of pardon. When we are cleansed by the precious blood of Christ. The blood of him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 1.5 But then we have what sometimes we call God's second law of pardon. When once we have come to Christ, we've been baptized into Christ. Galatians 3.27 and we sin, as we're going to look at a prominent example in the New Testament here shortly, where he was told after he believed and was baptized, and he sinned after that, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Acts chapter 8, verse 22. We are promised that if we follow God's prescription for forgiveness as Christians, that God will forgive. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Several years ago, I was preaching in a large metropolitan area where there were several churches of Christ. And one morning, the phone rang and there was a lady on the other end of the line. She was in tears. She was crying. She did not reveal her identity. She really did not want me to know who she was. I didn't even know what congregation she attended, but she indicated she was a member of the Lord's church. She was crying. She said, I have sinned. I said, well, what did you do? What happened? She said, I've committed adultery. Five years ago. Five years ago. And I asked her, well, did you repent of this sin? Did you confess the sin? Did you ask the forgiveness of the man that you committed fornication or adultery with? Yes. Did you ask your husband's forgiveness? Yes. And she even went before the church. She said, the problem is I cannot forgive myself. And I tried to assure her that if God forgives you, you should count yourself as forgiven. And then on the other hand, we have people who are very obstinate and prideful about their sins. They're unwilling to be lowly and contrite and humble. We're thankful for the good sister who came forward last night asking forgiveness. Certainly appreciate her. The Bible says regarding the humble and contrite person, in Isaiah 57 verse 15, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also, that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the heart of the contrite ones. This is what God will do for those who are in humility and contrition. He will dwell with them and he will revive them. Then also in Isaiah 66, the latter part of verse 2, the Lord said, But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Those two things go together. Humility, a person of a humble and lowly and contrite spirit, and those who tremble at the word of God. Why is it today as Brother Whitlock and Brother Hatcher and these great speakers last night also have pointed out the many things that are going on in the church today. One reason is pride. These people are not humble and lowly and contrite. They don't tremble at God's word anymore. They do not fear the true and the living God. In Proverbs 28, 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. That's a great statement regarding the confession of sins. The one who tries to hide sin or cover it up 
or refuses to acknowledge and confess his sins, that person will not be prospered by God. That person will not prosper, especially spiritually. I remember uh, several years ago, like Brother Jess mentioned a while ago, when I was a boy preacher, I was in my early 20s. I moved up to Virginia after I got out of college. And I encountered what was then known in the late 70s and the early 80s as the Crossroads Movement, later known as the Boston Movement and the Discipling Movement and the International Church of Christ or the Capital C on Church. Of course, we've probably all heard about them. One of the requirements that they had was for the junior prayer partner to confess his sins to the senior prayer partner. And of course, the leader of the group, the soul taught leader, I, I suppose all of them were supposed to acknowledge their sins to him. But they even required that individuals would confess the deepest, most secretive thoughts of their hearts and intimate sexual thoughts and things of this nature. This was a form of mind control and psychological manipulation. It is no wonder that this group got the name of being cultic in nature because they did control people like this. God does not require us to confess our innermost thoughts to other human beings. He does not require us to do what this particular movement required of its adherents. The Lord doesn't require that. But on the other hand, when we do fall into sin, we are required to confess our faults one to another. The American Standard Version renders the first part of James 5.16 as confess therefore your sins one to another. The idea is the confession of sins. But at this time, let's look at James chapter 5 and I want to read verse 15 and 16 together. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. This is regarding the, those who are sick to call the elders of the church unto them. I would like to look at the latter part here. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. That is, if he confesses them in a scriptural manner. And then verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Confession to the Lord is implied in verse 15. His sin shall be forgiven him. Brother Guy in Woods makes this comment regarding this passage. It is significant that this passage does not deal with confession to God. That is implied in verse, six, verse 15. To the elders or preachers exclusively, but to one another. It thus becomes the duty of elders and preachers to confess their sins to other members of the one body, as for others to confess sins to them. End of quote. How contrary this is to the doctrine of auricular confession of Roman Catholicism. You don't hear about the so-called Roman Catholic priests confessing their sins to the Catholic members, do you? It's always the other way around. Another thing about James 5.16 that it implies the truth of Galatians 3.28. That no matter who we are, we are all one in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what nationality or race or male or female or whether we be leaders in the church or not. We're all one in Christ. We are to confess our sins one to another. Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, verse 4. I'd like to turn back to the book of Psalms, Psalm 51. This is David's confessional prayer after he had committed adultery and deceit and cover up and murder in regard to Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, her husband. In verse number 3 and 4 he said, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. 
he confessed his sins, his transgressions against God's law. His sin was ever before him. Now that's another reason that many people do not repent of and confess their sins. They don't take their sin with the gravity that it needs to be taken. They don't look at it seriously enough. David's sin was ever before him. In verse number 4, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Someone might say, well, David, he sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah and his own family and the children of Israel. Yes, he did. But his sin was most pointedly against God. That's the idea here. We ought to always remember that. That any sin that we commit is first and foremost against the Lord. We may hurt other people. We may sin in private, but remember that all sin, any sin, is most pointedly against God. This is the reason that Joseph successfully overcame the solicitations of Potiphar's wicked wife. is because of his love for God. He said to her in Genesis 39, 9, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He didn't want to sin against her husband either, Potiphar. Or against her, no doubt. He didn't want to sin either. But he considered his relationship to God too precious to commit that sin. The great guard against sin is our love for the Lord and our love for others. Jesus said the first two great commandments are, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Mark 12, verse 30, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And surely if we have that kind of love for God first and for others, that will help us to stay out of sin, my friends. Now James said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The American Standard Version says, the supplication of a righteous man availeth much in its working. Now, certainly when we want to be forgiven and to confess our faults one to another, we're not going to go out here to a hypocrite or an unfaithful member of the body of Christ or a non-member of the body of Christ. We want the prayers of the righteous, do we not? We want them to pray for us. And James gives the reason here. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In 1 Peter 3, 12, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. We want the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous man. And surely we want to have the right attitude in approaching those who do need to make confession. I heard about an elder one time that went out to see a member of the church that was not faithful. And he pulled up in the yard, and the man came out of the car, and he wanted to know what he wanted. He said, I've come out here to straighten you out. And the man opened the door and pulled him out of the car. He said, I'll straighten you out. Well, that certainly is not the right attitude, is it? In Paul, in Galatians chapter 6, in verse number 1, I know Brother Curtis is going to deal with this, and I appreciate his good prayer a while ago, too, and the good song. In verse number 1 of Galatians 6, the Apostle Paul said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual. See, there's the faithful and the righteous right there. Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So we need to be meek in dealing with others because the idea is that any of us can fall into sin. And one of the brethren already mentioned in this series, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. All of us need to be aware of the fact that we can fall into sin. Now friends, at this time I'd like to go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. And here the apostle John says, 
If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. What is the sin unto death, and what is the sin not unto death? By the virtue of the fact that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, 1 John 1, 9. Obviously, the sin which is not unto death is that which we become forgiven of. Because we receive life upon our repentance and confession of sin. A sin that would have led us to death, separation from God, and ultimately and eternally the second death, the lake of fire, Revelation 21, verse 8, had we not repented of it. So God will forgive any sin that a brother or sister in Christ confesses, and life will be restored to us. James said, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. But the sin unto death is that sin which a brother will not repent of and acknowledge, and thus not be forgiven of. That sin leads unto death. Any sin that we're not forgiven of will cause us to die spiritually. For the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, verse 23. And lust, when it is finished, breath forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, breath forth death, according to James 1, verse 15. And so sin leads unto death. And here John says that we are not to pray for those, by implication, who will not confess their sin. How can we ask the Lord to forgive a person who refuses to repent? That's not even a scriptural thing to do. But what we can do is we can pray that they might come to repentance and that they might confess their sin and that they might be restored. But now let's go to the book of Acts chapter 8 and see the divine pattern of an example given to us of one who fell into sin after his obedience to the gospel. This is the one that we well know as Simon of Samaria. This man in Acts chapter 8 and verse 13 obeyed the gospel. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Many of the other Samaritans had obeyed the gospel according to verse number 12. And so Peter and John had to come down from Jerusalem because they were apostles and had to lay hands on these early converts to Christ because they did not have the completed New Testament written like we do today. They needed those gifts to guide the church in its infancy. And when they came down, they were able to do even that which Philip was not able to do. Philip was able to preach and to do the miracles, as we read in verses 5 through 11 and 12 and 13. But he was not able to bestow those gifts on others. Only the apostles could do that. We can also see Acts 19, 1 to 7 on that. Well, Simon observed that. Evidently, he saw something that some of our brethren don't see today. You know, these brethren that think that you can receive these gifts or be guided by the Holy Spirit apart from the Word? Well, Simon saw that it took the imposition of the apostolic hands to give anyone a miraculous gift. In verses 17 and 18, Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw, saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Simon did not only want what Philip had, the power to do miracles, he wanted apostolic power. And he tried to buy that power with money. Peter sternly rebuked him. Verse 20 beginning. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Peter rebuked him. And the denominations try to say that Simon was never saved. 
that he was never saved because if he had been, he couldn't fall away. They will insert the little word yet in verse 23. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and yet in the bond of iniquity. They have that little word. That reminds us of someone else in the ancient past who added one word to God's word. That being the devil himself. The Lord God had warned Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day they ate it thereof they would surely die. Genesis 2 verse 16 17. The devil comes into the garden in the form of a serpent, and he said in Genesis 3, 4, Ye shall not surely die. This is what false teachers do. They add one word to God's word. They want to change what the word of God says. The Bible warns against adding to and taking away from God's word. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. We are forbidden to add to and to take away from God's word. But this man, Simon, was saved. He did exactly what Jesus said is required to be saved in Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. This man believed and was baptized and was saved in verse 13. But he sinned. He went astray in his heart. This is where all sin begins, as well as obedience to God. We know it in Hebrews 3 verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And so to keep ourselves pure and in the straight and narrow way of Jesus Christ, we need to keep our hearts right. As David said in Psalm 119, 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. God's word has the power to keep us in the straight and narrow way of Jesus Christ. Well, Simon was very foolish in trying to buy the gift of God with money. But yet he was very wise in requesting the prayers of the righteous. We read here in verse 24, Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. He asked for prayer. He needed prayer. He needed forgiveness. And the Lord forgave him, no doubt, because he did what the Bible teaches. When we started the Central Congregation over six years ago, of course, there were people there in town that wondered, why are you starting this congregation? You know, we've got a congregation over here a few blocks away and another one over here, and we've got these congregations out here in the country, and you brethren here know why. We start faithful congregations. We wanted to go in the right direction. We had an older lady that I had known off and on through the years. She wasn't going anywhere. And she came and she was restored to the Lord. She repented of her sin and she confessed them. Well, she did not even live another year. But one Monday morning, her daughter went in and found her sitting at the kitchen table with her church clothes on, sitting at the table. She had died in the night. We had taken her back to her house that Sunday evening after worship. You know, friends, this is part of the Lord's work, isn't it? To see people come back to Christ. What a wonderful thing that is. We had an older man last year, the same thing. He repented, he confessed his sin, he came back to the Lord. And while I was in the Philippines, he passed away. But that man died in Christ. What a great thing that is, to see people confess their faults one to another. Now, what constitutes a valid confession? It must be from a penitent heart a heart of repentance. 
Repentance is a change of mind preceded by godly sorrow and followed by a change of conduct, a change of life, bringing forth fruits worthy of or meet for repentance. Matthew 3, 8, Luke 3, 8, Acts 16, verse 20. But there are many people who think that repentance is just being sorry. Well, I'm sorry that I've sinned. I did wrong. Just keep on going on your merry way. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, For godless sorrow work with repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now we as preachers and teachers and even members of the Lord's church, we have a duty here. And I know our good brother Paul is going to deal with that tomorrow, but we need to stir people to be moved to a godless hour. I'd like to go back to the book of Joel at this time in chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Here the prophet describes the nature of repentance. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. Don't just put on outward show. You need to be broken hearted over sin. And for that to be a godly sorrow, that sorrow must be Godward in nature. It cannot just be, well, I'm, I'm sorry for the consequences that have happened to me. Or maybe that I've lost a favor with some of my friends or family. Or the circumstance that I'm in. It must be Godward in nature. Brokenheartedness toward God. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. That's a great statement about repentance and forgiveness right there. As we think in terms of true repentance and confession, there are many empty confessions. After Judas betrayed the Lord, he went into the temple and cast down the 30 pieces of silver. He acknowledged that he had sinned, but he never repented there in Matthew 27, 3 to 5, and he went and hung himself. He had the sorrow of the world. You remember on two occasions in the book of 1 Samuel that King Saul, after he sinned, he said, I have sinned. 1 Samuel 15, 24. And in 16, 26, 21, he said, I have sinned, I have erred exceedingly. Well, he was right about that. But he never did repent and turn back to God. This is proven by the fact that the Lord would not answer him. 1 Samuel 28, verse 6. And he even went to the point that he went to the witch at Endor there in 1 Samuel chapter 28. And he promised that he would stop pursuing David, but he didn't repent of that. And David knew that he would still try to take his life. Then we go to the book of 2 Samuel. And this is where David confessed his sin to Nathan. 2 Samuel 12, verse 14. 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. David was truly penitent in his heart, and he confessed his sin. And yet we know there were many consequences that followed because of the sin that he had committed. It reminds me of the story of a man one time that took his son out to the barn. And he took a hammer and nail and drove the nail into the barn door. And then he pulled it out. He said, son, sin is like that. You sin, yes, you can be forgiven, but it always leaves a scar. It always leaves a scar. There are many consequences that come because of our sins, even often when we are forgiven. But last of all, for the last few minutes, public confessions and private confessions. This is one of the things in the church that we sometimes have a discussion about when should a person confess their sins privately and publicly. Going back to James 5, 16, we believe that implies, and we understand it to teach this, that the sin should be acknowledged as publicly or as privately as it was committed. If it was committed before one, two, or a few, it should be acknowledged and confessed in that manner. But if it's public in nature, 
then it should be confessed in that way. When I was preaching in the congregation one time, we had a, a young lady, and she came up expecting a child. And we would try to talk to her, and what would happen was on Sunday night, the brethren would have people that hadn't taken the Lord's Supper on that Sunday morning to come down the aisle and sit on the front seat and take the Lord's Supper. And several times she would come down the aisle in front of everybody, and there she was. She never repented of her sin, never acknowledged it. And she'd sit on the front seat. And it'd be hard to talk to her. She'd kind of slip out where you couldn't talk to her. So one time I did corner her. And I kindly tried to tell her that you need to make things right with the Lord. And she said, this is between me and God. I tried to explain to her, yes, it's between you and God, but it's also public. It affects the church. When people sin and bring reproach on the church, it does affect the body of Christ. But on the other hand, and this will be the concluding thought, in Matthew chapter 18, the words of Jesus here indicate that the Lord wants our problems to be solved privately as much as possible if it is private in nature. In Matthew 18, verse 15, beginning, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. If a brother gets into it with another brother, and maybe he curses or says things that are untoward toward him, he needs to take care of that between him and his brother. And the one who's been offended doesn't need to go out and broadcast it to everybody either, which is what sometimes happens. But then there's another step if he won't repent. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Again, this is an effort to confine it to just a few people. Then, of course, if he won't hear them, it is to be brought before the church, and the church is to bring their influence to bear, and if he will not hear the church, he is to be considered as a heathen man and a publican, he's to be withdrawn from, according to 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. I want to briefly say this. This does not apply to public false teaching. Amen. That is often an error that we see. Well, have you been to this person who's teaching error? Have you been to them? Have you followed Matthew 18? Matthew 18, for instance, has to do with personal offenses, not with public false teaching. Paul tells us how to deal with public false teaching. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. There is to be a public exposure and refutation of false teachers. And this also would apply to those who are sinning out in public, such as the fornicating brother living with his father's wife. First Corinthians chapter 5, Paul doesn't tell them to follow the Matthew 18 prescription. When they came together again, together again, they were to take care of that matter, that his soul might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, and that that little leaven that left the whole lump would not contaminate the entire congregation. Friends, I thank you for your kind attention and for the great blessing of being here at Bellevue. Thank you. Danny, we appreciate that excellent lesson. You know, those individuals who ask that question, well, have you been to them? Did they come to you first? Uh, if they're going to be consistent before they rebuke you in a public way, which they are doing generally, they need to come to you first. But they're not going to go by their own standard, which is a false standard anyway. But uh, they're not consistent with it. Uh, they want to disallow you the God-given right and obligation that uh, you have as an individual in rebuking error and yet won't take that same responsibility. It's usually in an attempt to try to give encouragement and defend the false teacher. 
but confession of sin is something that all individuals, I mean, we, we all sin even as Christians, and we all need to make things right in the way in which God has set it forth. You didn't use this terminology, but I think uh, it, it does bear stating that confession of sin is not publication of sin. And that's what you're getting at, and to, you make it right with as few people as know it. You don't have to publicize the sin. 